Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Shiloh Lundahl. Thanks for being on the show, Shiloh. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Shallow is a child and family therapist in Mesa, Arizona, and a real estate investor who has accumulated over 85 properties during the last few years. These properties include a commercial building, a mobile home park, 45 single-family residences, and a few multifamily properties. Although he has not created a large syndication, he has raised over a million dollars of private money from over 40 private money lenders in order to build his portfolio. He also runs a monthly the real estate meetup group in Mesa, where he teaches and coaches other investors. He just got in tell me, taught an eight hour block of, of other, other investors. And, and so Shiloh, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate, uh, you know, you being willing to come on and share your expertise with, uh, with myself and our listeners, uh, but give them a little more about who you are. Well, so, um, I, you know, I, I finished my schooling in 2008 and then I moved down to Arizona. I've been uh, practicing as a child and family therapist for the last 11 years. And what's interesting is as a therapist, you, um, you know, you really uh, help people in very vulnerable situations and, you know, they look up to you a lot to, to help them. And so it was really important for me to not do any harm to my clients. And so there's a, an ethical obligation to do no harm. And so as, um, with that ethical obligation, I felt like I needed to get more and more training. And so I spent a lot of money on going to conferences and things like that to learn how to become a better therapist. And I realized that um, in order to do that, it was going to be pretty expensive. And so I, this was again, back in the day, I thought, you know, how, um, if I really want to become a really good therapist, I need to um, go to some of these trainings that are expensive. I need to get some more money in order to be able to do that. And that's actually what sparked the idea of doing real estate investing was I wanted to become a better therapist. So I needed more money in order to do these trainings. And so I, I started off with one single family residence back in 2010 in my neighborhood. And then from there, I just rented it out to a family that I knew that wanted to move into the neighborhood and they rented it out for about five years. And then at that time, I had become independently licensed, and then I was in this uh, building that uh, the landlord decided they were going to be selling the building. And so I approached the landlord, and I asked if, uh, um, well, I approached the other therapist in my office, because I was the youngest therapist in the office at the time, and I asked them if they would mind if I tried to purchase the building. And they're like, no, oh, that'd be fine. And so, because I didn't think that they thought that I was going to be able to do it. So I contacted the seller's realtor. And I started negotiating with him in order to, um, to purchase the building that I had my practice in. And um, ultimately, I was able to do that. And then I opened up, it was a building that had two suites. I opened up the other suite, and then we put 12 different therapists in the building. And then um, at that point, I was watching a lot of um, shows on HGTV. I just got the building, and I you know, developed this bug for, hey, this is really cool. I think I want to invest in real estate. So I contacted a buddy of mine who later has become my real estate partner. And he was a realtor and I asked him, um, I told him that I wanted to do a deal with him. So back at the very beginning of 2015, we did a deal together and it was just a flip property, but it worked out really, really well. Um, I was the, the money partner on the deal, uh, but he found it, he negotiated it, he coordinated everything. And I just got to kind of be a, a partner with him on the deal. And, uh, you know, I earned about 13000 through lending my money and he earned about 40000 And he did it without using much, of, much, if any, of his own money. And so it was a really interesting model and it was great to learn from him. And that's really kind of how we got started in real estate. In 2015, we flipped um, about three properties, 2016, and about six or seven properties. And then we started to notice that the market for flipping properties wasn't very it, there wasn't as much margin anymore in flipping properties. And so we switched our model from a flipping model to a lease option model where we can buy these properties, um, rent them out to people that want to buy the property eventually. 
and they come in with uh, about four thousand dollars down in order to buy an option to buy that property and we after doing the numbers we found that we usually make about three times the amount on a lease option um, on a three or four or five year lease option than we do on a flip and so that's when we just kind of decided to switch our model and then we've just been buying properties um, a little bit more than one a month over the last three years and so that's how we got about 45 single family properties and then my buddy found a mobile home park in the area that we like to buy and and uh that, that actually turned out to be a really, really good deal. Um, and so we, we bought that. But along the way, what was interesting is I noticed, um, and, and to you know, be pretty transparent, my wife and I, after we started doing real estate in 2015, um, we did a deal where we lost $5,000 on it. And um, I had gone to like one of those three-day trainings and told my wife, hey, sweetie, there's this year-long training that we could go to. It's like $40,000 to know what I'm doing. And she's like, no. I'm like, okay. And then after we lost $5,000 on a deal, she went and she found another training and said, Hey, I went and I saw this training and I signed this up. We're going to this training. And so I'm like, all right. So we went to this uh, year long training program in how to invest in real estate. It was one of those guru programs that was expensive, but it worked really well for us because we were in a position where we could pay for the trading and we still had money left over in order to start investing and made some really, really good contacts that opened up our ability to get loans from banks and things like that. And so ultimately that really helped springboard us into investing in real estate. Increase so, your network, um, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That was, yeah, that's a big plus of, of a lot of programs like that. You're getting some education, but I feel like a lot, a lot of the bigger value you get is, is all the contacts and the network increase. But, uh, you know, yeah. it's awesome about your wife as well. I know a lot of spouses, you know, if one loses a lot of money, they'd be like, no, we're not doing anything else in that, right. you know, in real estate or whatever that is you're pursuing, you know, so, but, but she actually pursued some training. So that's awesome. And it sounds like that springboarded, you know, you all, uh, you know, when in that process, obviously you all have grown a lot over the last few years, but when in that process, did you, you know, decide to, you know, that we need to start raising money, you know, or we need to be able to bring money from other sources so we can grow. So as part of that program, I had a, um, a coach, a real estate uh, investing coach, a great guy. He was really, really helpful. And um, he, so we had a coaching call every, every week. And in that coaching call, he would obviously ask, you know, how are things going through the state? What are you working on? And then he would coach us through that. But one thing that he said over and over and over again was um, two things. One, you need an assistant, you need an assistant, you need an assistant. And two, you need to learn how to raise money. You need to learn how to raise money. He said, um, with, using your own money, you can only get so far in real estate um, until you run out of your own money. You have to learn how to raise money from other people. And so that's what he said, but I was nervous about raising money from other people. Even though I had done really well in managing my own finances, which I think is very important in order, or before you raise other people's money, make sure that you with your own finances are really good, that you know how to budget, that you know how to stay within that budget. Very, very important because if you don't know how to manage your own money, you're not going to magically become better at managing other people's money. So I knew Great how to do that. Great advice, by the way. And I've had Thank investors you. ask me about my own finances and are they in order? <laughs> yeah. Not very often, but you know, you know, I mean, they want to know just what you said. They're, they're experienced investors and, and are sav very savvy and they want to know you're savvy as well. Yeah. And I think that's great. I never thought to ask that at, when I invested in somebody else's deal, how well they did with their personal finances, but very, very important question. So um, anyway, we, um, what was I saying before that? <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, we're we, talking about the coach that, you know, he said he needed to assist oh, yeah, yeah, you, to raise you. money. And <laughs> yeah. So he, he really encouraged me to raise money. And so it, the, we got to a point where it's like, okay, well, we can't get any more deals. And I, you know, I, I tried to ask a, a family member um, for some money and, and he's like, well, I don't lend, lend money to family because it hasn't worked out for me in the past. I'm like, all right. So I'm like, all right, so I'm trying to structure this. How can we make it so that it's um, enticing for somebody to lend us money? And I didn't want to give away the farm in lending money. So I'm like, all right, how can we do this? Well, there's a lot of people that are new that want to learn how to invest. And so I'm like, all right, well, what if I were to create a teaching program, but, but instead of keeping their money, they get their money back but with interest, but I still taught them. And so that's kind of the program that we made is we 
we would, um, so somebody would lend us like $10,000. So what I did, I started putting on what's called second position notes on my property. So if I would get a note, uh, a loan from the bank for 70% of what a property is worth. So let's say I had a property worth a hundred thousand, the bank loaned me 70 and I still had about 10% of my own money into the, into the deal because I was able to buy it under market value and fix it up and stuff pretty economically. So my all in is 80, the bank gave me 70. I still have 10 in the property. So I opened it up to people that wanted to learn if they wanted to put, come in with like $10,000. Then what I would do is I would um, give them a second uh, position note on the, I'm sorry, I give them a, a promissory um, note in second position um, for that $10,000. And it was earning like eight, eight to 10%, you know, depending on the, the note. Um, and then they would also get a deed of trust on the property so that their investment was protected. <clears throat> and so um, I, as I started doing that, I just thought, okay, if I could get one person to invest in this, I know I could get 10. And so I was reaching out to people and then one person said, yeah, I'd be interested in that. And as soon as- How are you reaching out to people? So um, a lot of it actually came from bigger pockets. So me just kind of um, posting uh, on the forums on bigger pockets and just, you know, sharing a little bit about what I was doing. Some people would kind of reach out to me. I put in my, um, in my bio kind of what I did and how we had these second position notes and stuff. And so I, I went to lunch with somebody one day and she's like, yeah, I think I'd, I'd be interested in that. And so she got for 10,000, a second position performing note. And then within the next week, I got two more. So now I'd raised 40 or 30,000 at that time. And then um, from there, uh, it was a lot easier to just start raising more and more. And, and we have, as you mentioned, this meetup in Mesa. And so as we're talking about the deals that we're doing, and then at the end, I would just let them know that, hey, if anybody's interested in learning more about our process, you can lend to us in one of our deals, and then I would show you. And so when it comes to you know, the difference between a syndication and then private loans, and this is really, really important to do this correctly, because if you don't do it correctly, then you can get in trouble. With a syndication, you, um, you have to do everything according to what the SEC tells you to do. And then if you do that, then you can take on private money, you can do this, um, you know, buy properties worth a lot more money and you know apartment buildings and things like that i was just doing these um single family homes and so rather than doing a syndication or creating a fund i would bring in a a private money lender on one deal so basically as a private money lender you can lend anybody your money but it's not an investment an investment is i'm putting money in where i could lose it um it could go up and it could go down this is different this is a loan from one person to me or to my business. And then what I do is I give them a promissory note on, and then a deed of trust on a very specific property. And so, and in that promissory note, it, it defines, this is the interest that you're earning on your loan. Um, and it isn't, it isn't that it's gonna go up, it isn't that it's gonna go down, that's the amount that you're earning. And so um, with, with us and our company, we have enough reserves to make sure that we uh, are stable so that I can make sure that I, I give the, um, the private money lenders back their money and their interest as we go and we um, refinance all of these properties. So those are some important things. When you're lending to somebody, you need to make sure that they have enough reserves to weather the storms that come. So if somebody were to ask you um, if you wanted to in, invest in one of their deals, one of the first questions would be, okay, and so if it goes bad, what's it gonna look like? Like mm -hmm. what's the worst case scenario? How am I going to get my money back in that situation? How much do you keep on reserves in case something were to happen? Um, and, we, and we've had people ask us that, and then we explain, and this is the amount of money that we have in reserves. And then um, worst case scenario would probably be this, and then this is how we would handle that. And that's really, really important as you're investing with people. One thing that has made me successful is something that most people don't think of. It's the way that I've branded myself online. If you want to brand yourself to raise more capital, then I suggest working with my friend Adam Adams. So go ahead, scroll down, and find the link in the show notes. No doubt. Wow, some great information there. And I wonder, though, you know, from when you started, you know, trying to raise money or, or uh, you know, borrow money or find money so you can grow your business, you know, do you still have that same model now? Or, or you know, do you have, you know, other uh, private lenders or other investors? What does the model look like now compared to then? So it is a similar model, but what is interesting is as the market's gone up in value, um, a lot of our properties have gone up in value. And so we were able to take 
um, like 18 properties over this last summer, we were able to take 18 of our properties and then put them in a portfolio loan. So we had like um, 20 year loans uh, at like around 5% adjustable. We were able to take all of those and switch them over into a long term portfolio loan um, fixed at seven, um, fixed for seven years at about 5% as well. Um, but it was amortized over 30 years. So our cash flow went up and then we were able to pay out a ton of those second position notes where I was paying between eight and, and 10% on those notes. And so it was great because, um, you know, our investors were happy. They got their money back or I'm sorry, our lenders were happy. They got their money back and they got their interest during the time. I was happy because it allowed us to grow. And then we were able to put it into this long-term um, portfolio loan, making things a lot easier. And then also um, we were able to pay off high interest rate debt and it was just fantastic. And so that's what we're doing now as we have these properties coming up in value. We're, we're grouping them. We're putting them into portfolio loans, paying off the um, individual lenders um, on the second positions. And um, again, I, I mentioned this, but, we, we've been able to raise about a, a million dollars in private money. And the way that we've done that has been a lot through bigger pockets and just kind of sharing with people what we do a lot through my meetup. So what I think when it comes to raising um, private money, the biggest thing is being successful. When you're doing deals and you're successful at doing deals, people see that you have a track record. They feel confident in coming and um, lending money to you because you've done it before several times. And their, their confidence in you is pretty high, especially if you're like in the community and you're rooted in the community. If, if they don't know you, if they don't know that you're like rooted in the community, then, well, I don't know if this guy is just going to take off one day and leave. But because I right. have a uh, practice here in, in Arizona and I'm meeting with clients here, you know, daily, they know that I'm here. I'm not just going to come in for a weekend, get people's money and then take off. So, you know, experiencing this kind of growth, I mean, in just a few years, you know, doing this many deals, uh, you know, and, and, and pushing to grow even faster. I, I know that that creates other growing pains, right? And, and I know, yeah. you know we've experienced those and, and, and it's good. Like it causes us to grow and causes us to get better and improve all the time. And that's something we're always striving to do. Uh, you know, so tell me about some ways like, you know, through this growth, you, you've been able to manage that and, and continue to grow. You know, that's such a good question because I look at the growth of an investor the same as uh, the growth of a, a child from baby through, you know, toddlerhood, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. So <clears throat> it's funny, my, uh, my partner and I talk about how we uh, just went through, you know, in, investor puberty the other day. So now we're, you know, we're, we feel like we're more towards uh, getting close to graduating high school when it comes to investing, uh, meaning that <clears throat> we... Um, you know, we started out and a lot of people will start out with a small investment. Okay. Or maybe they'll put their money in a, in a syndication, something that they trust and, and uh, they, they only have a small part in the whole process. And then they start to learn, they start to grow, they start to meet other people. And this is all kind of the infant stage of investing, you know, the idea meeting with some people, and then they start feeling more comfortable. They, they hear the words and they know what the word syndication means. They know what, um, you know, difference between hard money and private money. And they, they start to understand all of these little differences in, in the jargon that's used in the investing world. And so they, they start to feel more confident and they might go and do a second property and, and that's going well. And so they, they feel confident. I, I think I know what I'm doing, but along the way, it's likely they're going to make quite a few mistakes and like, Oh, that's painful. So, you know, you want to be careful at the beginning. You want to, you want to get out and go, you know, jump in, be willing to do that and take that risk. But at the same time, as you do that, then slow down just a little bit, see what you're doing, see what the mistakes are that you're making, and then recover from some of those mistakes and then keep going. And so that's kind of what we've done. And then um, the, the adolescent part or the puberty part that I would say that has to do with uh, investing is when you get too big to handle things yourself and you need to start systematizing in order to keep growing. And that's a difficult part because handling the books for my businesses is very, very difficult and complicated. 
so I was always big into doing personal finance and budgeting. And to be honest, my wife and I had budgeted to the penny for the last, uh, ever since we've been married. So for 15 years, and I don't say that we're fanatics about it just with our budgeting system, you really need to budget to the penny. Otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't come out right. And you don't know if you've entered everything in. So it's important that, that we did it that way. And I started to try to do that with my business finances, but man, that was tough. It was really, really tough because we had so many things coming in and out. We were flipping, we had some buy and holds. And so I had to hire an accountant to help me through that process. And accountants are expensive. And so um, with, with that, um, that's kind of the puberty part. I can't handle this all on my own. I need to get other people helping me. And so we got an assistant. And as soon as we got an assistant, oh boy, um, that was so helpful. But it was really difficult because I felt like, uh, I don't know, I don't want to pay somebody right. um, all the time to do all these things. Um, where that, where's that money going to come from? But then I realized, you know, as a therapist, you know, I charge people over $100 an hour. And uh, during my second flip, I would, during my lunch break, go out to my property that we were flipping and I was mowing the lawn at the property. And my buddy's like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm mowing the lawn at the property. He's like, that is like a $20 job. Pay somebody else to do that. <laughs> and so um, I realized, you know, I could work for one more hour as a therapist and I could pay somebody five hours to go and do all that. That was some work. wisdom right there. He spoke into you, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And so Tell me that is... That is part of the process of, of development as an investor is you, you start letting go of some things and then you start you know, really focusing on the things you do well. You start finding other people that do the things well that you don't do well. And that's part of the, the growth process. Tell me about how you found your assistant. So it was interesting. Um, I had uh, somebody in my neighborhood that also was involved in real estate. Uh, they had a friend and um, she was looking for some part-time work. And so um, we hired her and um, she started to work for us. But what's interesting is I've really come to understand the process of hire slow, fire quick, rather than hire quick and fire slow. Um, because with her, you know, she worked with us and in the very beginning she was doing pretty well and she seemed pretty confident and, and excited about what she was doing. And then there were some things coming up in her family that, that were difficult and so eventually, um, things weren't going so well for her because uh, there were some major things that were going on. And, and so um, I give her a call to have her go in and do something for me. Um, and, but that day she was just kind of, she was out of it. She just was not able to, to function because of all of the difficult things that were going on for her. And so I felt bad every time I called her to ask if she could do something. And I'm like, my business is just really not going anywhere right now. <laughs> and um, so uh, then we brought on another assistant. So somebody that actually found a property for us. Um, so uh, it was interesting. She, she found a property. She was selling it to a wholesaler who then was selling it to other people. We got the property, but we saw that she had found it. So we reached out to her and um, had lunch with her. And she was uh, just really positive. She spoke both English and Spanish, and um, which was really helpful for us with some of the tenants that we have. And so... Um, we asked her if, uh, you know, she'd want to do some stuff for us, some work for us. And she said, yeah. And so we gave her a few properties to kind of help us out with. And she just, uh, she rocked it. She did fantastic. And so we gave her a few more properties in order to help us out. And she was doing a great job. And so over, you know, over a six month period of time, eventually we gave the other assistant less and less and less and gave her more and more and more. And the other assistant was moving and, and everything like that. And so it just kind of worked for us to stop using the other assistant and then start using her full time. And so truthfully, she works full time for us. Um, and she does a ton of stuff. She, she manages all of the rehabs, manages the mobile home park. So that again is another part of the whole process of development as an investor is, man, you need an assistant. If you're gonna scale, give them an assistant. If you want just one, one to five properties, uh, you can probably handle those yourself. But when you get over 10 properties, and if you have your own full-time job, get an assistant and pay them hourly. Have somebody who's trustworthy that they're not going to lie about their hours that they're working. But um, uh, yeah, get an assistant that's going to help you. And that will take off so much off your plate. And then you can actually start scaling more and more if you want. 
I couldn't agree more. I could not do everything we're doing without numerous assistants, especially, you know, like an executive assistant that's, I mean, really my right hand. Um, you know, there's numerous other people that support us through an assistant mm -hmm. role, doing other specialized things, but it just couldn't do it without them. I mean, by, by no means. And I've said this before on the show, but we use an app called Voxer, you know, so we can, it's like a walkie talkie app where we communicate a lot. And, and, but, you know, even if I just have random thoughts about, Hey, this is a way we can improve this or this is something we could do here. Or, I mean, just at random times, I just document it that way. And then I know she's like documented it in a way that we're going to use that later, you know, or just so many different ways that like you're talking about when you're scaling. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just been a must uh, and completely agree. Um, yeah. So any, anything else or any other ways that you plan to move forward using assistance in, in a way maybe we hadn't thought of? Well, so our market has mostly been in Arizona, but, uh, you know, I, I lived in uh, North Carolina for uh, summer. I really liked North Carolina. And so uh, we were looking at uh, going to a secondary market. We looked at Texas, we looked at Florida, we looked at Georgia, I think, and Tennessee and, um, and North Carolina. And out of all of those, we decided on North Carolina. And with our lease option model, it works really, really well in buying properties under 145. Well, buying properties where our all in is $145,000 or less. And that number is 75% of what the after repair value is of the property. So that it builds in equity about 25%. With that model, we're able to buy properties, suck out the majority of our own money, and then um, continue to, to buy properties. And then when we're not able to suck out all of our money, we'll put a second position note on the property and then we're able to suck out our money and then continue to go. And there's still equity over and above that. And so we're going to take that model that we used in Arizona that worked really well. And we're going into North Carolina. We bought one property last month and we're uh, closing on another property um, uh, here in the next uh, week or two. And then uh, our goal this next year is to get about uh, 24, 25 properties. And then the following year, another 25 properties in North Carolina. And just following the same model um, with a uh, you know, second uh, position note investors along with hard money and then take those, and refinance them into, into portfolio loans and just continue to collect properties. And, and so we're going to need to build a uh, presence out. And it's actually going to be the tri area or the mm -hmm. triad area of North Carolina. So Greensboro, Winston-Salem and, and High Point is where we're going. Uh, we see a lot of uh, great little properties out there. And uh, North Carolina in general is, uh, is really um, started to um, appreciate in a lot of the bigger cities. And so when we saw that here in, in Arizona, we saw appreciation come to you know, Gilbert, Mesa, um, and some of those other areas in the East Valley where we invest mostly in. And so we started to invest in the cities just outside of those. And our properties have increased in value probably by 50% in a two or three year period. So we really wow. think that um, the triad area is probably going to start increasing in value quite a bit as well. So that's what we're doing. And that's our plan. Yeah. Well, next time you're in that area, let me know. I'm not far from there. Uh, but before we run out of time, just a few more questions, Shallow. Uh, what's a way that you've recently improved your business that we could also apply to ours? So um, we have a... Um, an accountant that's also been kind of a business coach. So he isn't just your run of the mill accountant. He he's expensive, but he does a great job. And, and what he's mentioned to us because we were growing and he said, okay, this is what I think you should do. I think you should sell a quarter of your real estate business. I'm like, I don't want to sell any of my real estate business. I like my real estate business. I don't want to sell it. He's like, you do. And this is why you want to sell it. Because <clears throat> when you sell a quarter of that, you're going to be able to take off, take about, about $400,000 is what we're selling a quarter of our business for. You take that, you pay off all of these little debts that you have that you've used in order to fund the business. And then that, um, that $400,000 that you have in there, it doesn't, it doesn't look at as debt anymore. That's just a capital contribution by a new member of your LLC. And so it's going to improve your, um, it's going to improve the way that your business looks and functions. Banks are going to want to give you more loans now because your debts have, gone way way down and um so that's what we're doing right now and that's one thing that we're doing in order to move forward is um my accountant gave me this great idea he's going to prepare something as we go and we're probably just going to go to maybe one or two private uh, money lenders that we know so we're not going to create a syndication around this although we have considered creating a fund we're still in that process but right now we're just going to sell 
a quarter of the business to one or two people that we know. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing now in order to really propel us forward. Cause then we're going to take about a hundred thousand of that. And that's going to be some seed money as we go into North Carolina. Wow. So what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Ooh, now that's really, really tough because there's so many different things that have contributed to my success. <clears throat> one thing is, um, I have a very strong drive, and I think that that has been uh, a big contributor to my success. Now, I make a lot of mistakes because I have a strong drive, but I also um, am able to get up from those mistakes. So I think, you know, to answer your question, I think the thing that's contributed most to my success has been being a wrestler in high school. And uh, that might sound weird, but uh, I that probably um, has helped me be more than anything that's helped me be successful in life. And the reason being is because um, I had some really great coaches as uh, a high school wrestler, but basically you would go out there and in practice you would wrestle and then you got tired and you wanted to stop. And that was the middle of practice. And then you'd have to get up and the coach would say, okay, grab a partner, okay, wrestle. And then you'd wrestle and you were tired. And then he'd say, okay, grab another partner and wrestle. And if you weren't wrestling hard, then he would tap your partner out. He would go and he'd beat you up for a little while until you started wrestling harder. And, um, but what was interesting is just developing the mindset of when things are difficult, what do you do? You go harder, you work mm. harder, you know what I mean? And, and so really, um, getting out of difficult situations meant just working harder, you know, and working smarter as well, connecting with great people. And that's been probably the second thing. So the first thing is, uh, as I was a wrestler, I learned how to work hard. And then second networking with people has been so, so helpful because I've gotten into a couple of positions that were very difficult. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And so I went to somebody who was a more experienced investor and said, Hey, this is my situation. And the, the more experienced investor said, well, this is what you do. And then he outlined exactly how to do it. I'm like, Oh, and then he helped me with it. And then I was able to get out of that difficult situation. It cost a lot of money, but I was able to get out of it and it was really helpful. And so that's probably the second thing is developing a great network. Wow. Yeah. And I can relate to that. I can even, you know, go back to like military training and things like that, you know, boot camp, you know, and, and the similar situations where you're, you know, they're putting you in just tough, tough situations just time and time again, and, and really just, you know, making you see what you can put yourself through and, and, and keep going, you know, and that, that just quitting is not an option. So no, that's awesome. Uh, but and before we have to go, tell us how you like to give back. Oh, I appreciate that. One thing that, that we do as a family is each, uh, each Christmas, um, we like to adopt a family. Um, and we've been doing this ever since, you know, I was going to school. And, and when I was going to school, we, you know, uh, we made probably 20,000 a year together, my wife and I. And so we didn't have a lot to give at the time. Um, but each year we would, uh, give, uh, you know, adopt a family and give a family and, um, a Christmas. And um, uh, a couple years back, um, we went out of state to, uh, to celebrate Christmas since we didn't have a family that we were going to adopt. And we saw one of those, um, uh, one of those people from the Salvation Army outside of Walmart. And um, so we talked with our kids about, oh, hey, this is what we want to do to adopt a family this year. We're going to give what we would to a family over to the Salvation Army guy. And um, it was uh, really, really neat as my kids went up there and, and they were giving, you know, quite a bit of money in this little pot, you know, <clears throat> what's usually not done. And so um, it was really neat to see them do that. And the Salvation Army guy, as he was watching, you know, us donate that and just started to cry. And it was really, really neat to have that experience where um, we were able to do that for family and, and well, do it for the Salvation Army that year. And, and just uh, our kids doing that got to experience what it was like to give. And so that's one thing that we do uh, to give back. That's awesome. Uh, thanks for sharing that. It's, it's great how your, your kids are involved in that as well. Uh, I think that's, that's great for building character and teaching them many, many things. Great, uh, a lot, many good teaching moments, you know, created there uh, with, with kids. But uh, Michelle, you know, thank you so much for your time today on the show. I appreciate you just going through your business and how you all have been successful in real estate, even while, you know, you're a therapist, you know, with a full-time position and how you've hired an assistant and some of those struggles, but now how, you know, you've, we've worked through those and even moving uh, into another market, you know, and growing a team there and a business there, and all, actually across, all the way across the country. So 
appreciate you sharing that. And uh, but tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you. So <clears throat> I'm pretty active on Bigger Pockets. People can reach out to me through Bigger Pockets. Um, they can and my phone number is there on, on bigger pockets as well so just uh go to the search bar put in my name shiloh lundahl and then you'll be able to um, find me you can reach out to me there thank you for listening to the real estate syndication show brought to you by lifebridge capital lifebridge capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50 percent of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption lifebridge capital making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.